Now I know we're in Benton Chapel and there is always to be a certain amount of reverence in this place, but this is a celebration this morning. This is Perry Wallace's 70th birthday and Karen was very clear with me just a few minutes ago. She's from New Orleans and the only thing we really need now are umbrellas. <laughs> so, in the spirit of celebration, in the spirit of memory and sadness and joy and questions and answers and just hanging out, I ask you to join in this celebration with both feet, both hands, your eyes, your mouth, every bit of you, and know that this is a time to celebrate a remarkable life, not a sad one, a remarkable life. We began with Carnival of Venice. It was one of Perry's favorite songs. It's um, a little bit of a masochistic song for trumpeters, but I do believe our trumpeter had the chops to handle it. Thank you. We hope today that we will celebrate and capture the essence of Perry. His love of music, his courage, his grace, his determination, and more. As we gather in this chapel, I encourage us to celebrate all of the holy things that the creator of life leads you to share as we begin by learning more about Perry as a student and as an athlete. Please welcome in this order, Coach Melvin Black, followed by Godfrey Dillard and Commissioner Greg Sankey. To Karen, Gabrielle, to Jesse, Bessie, and Annie, and to all of you who gather here today, I just want to share with you a few moments about a good neighbor. <clears throat> In 1971, State Farm Insurance Company adopted a slogan like a good neighbor. That slogan has endured the test of times and continue to be the vital part of the company's DNA. Long before State Farm stand out slogan, Perry Wallace was a personification of a good neighbor. He was attentive, caring, and hardworking. In the fall of 1962, there, was, there were words on the street about a young man basketball player at Warden Junior High School that was destined to be a superstar. But at that time, Washington Junior High School, a rival junior high school, was full of talented players. But Pearl's coach Ridley saw Paris' performance in his first game and he never missed another game during the season. Perry was good. Even in junior high school, he was focused, he had good worth ethics, and he was a team player. Perry knew how to be a good neighbor. When Perry came to Pearl, he went right to work. You could tell he was driven by excellence 
In the classroom, he was a scholar. In fact, he would shift from being the student and became the teacher. You see, Perry was notorious for helping his classmates and teammates to get their assignment. He simply wanted everyone to do well. He was a gentleman and a scholar. Perry was modeling what it was to be a good neighbor. On the basketball court, he was a force to be reckoned with. He was intimidated and had a way of staring down his opponents, daring them to come inside for a shot. His leadership on the basketball court led the team to win two championships, one during the period of segregation, the other during integration. No matter the discourse that was happening in the nation or in our communities, Perry's character and his disposition on and off the court was unparalleled. This kind of presentation was representative of a good neighbor. Perry meant the world to Pearl High School, and I think it's fair to say that Pearl High School meant the world to Perry. The school provided a training ground for his growth development, and he unselfishly gave back to Pearl. Perry took pride in his physical condition. During the preseason, most of the basketball players were hanging out, skipping school, and trying to impress the girls. Not Perry. You could always find him in the waiting room, training for the next season. He was just that kind of guy. In fact, he had it so good he thought he could figure out how to make a job out of this, make a business out of it, and became an unofficial physical therapist at the school. Now his Clients, first clients were James Douglas, Joe Herbert, Ted McLean, and Walter Fisher. They were teammates on the championship team. They trusted Perry. They respected his work ethics and intellect. After all, Perry was only being a good neighbor. I'm sure that many people can attest to Perry's mild-mannered nature, his electric smile, his determination, and gentle spirit. There's nothing like witnessing a young kid, 16, 17, or 18 years old, leading his team into the battle, gathering his troops, and delivering his version of Psalms 121 before every game. I will lift my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He that keepeth thee shall suffer thy footstep to be moved. For the body without soul is lost. If you say to a mountain, mountain be removed and cast into the sea, so shall it be according to his words. So if the Lord is with us, who can be against us? The team then would lead, follow him in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, I will be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. I want to leave you with this. Perry was a man who lived by the code to do the right thing and tried with all his might to love everyone he touched. And when his life had a way of getting in the way, learned the lesson and kept on trucking. In fact, he lived exactly as the Creator prescribed in Micah 6.8, to act with justice, to treasure the Lord's gracious love, to walk humbly in the company of your God, Perry Wallace is still a good neighbor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. 
What a wonderful morning this is. On this uh, gorgeous campus, at this great university, to celebrate the life and times of Perry Wallace. I had the honor of being Perry's friend, not because we were the first black athletes at Vanderbilt University and at the Southeast Conference, but because he loved me. In my opinion, the great characteristics of a great teammate, teammate are three. Talent, intelligence, friendship. Talent. Perry definitely had talent. He played for the historic Pearl High School here in Nashville. He was a high school All-American in basketball. He was featured in Sports Illustrated, the number one sports magazine in America at the time. He was a Tennessee State basketball champion, an All-SEC player. His jersey was retired by Vanderbilt and now hangs in Memorial Gymnasium. He's a member of the Michigan, of, of the Tennessee State Hall of Fame and had a pro basketball tryout with the Philadelphia Sixers of the National Basketball Association. But what is often overlooked is that he played in the turbulent 1960s, when the talent of black basketball players was being suppressed in deference to a preference for teams being populated primarily by white players. His best shot, the dunk, was banned. You couldn't do it in a game. A clear and direct action to stop the rise of black talent in the sport of basketball. God blessed you, Perry, and you welcomed him into your heart. Intelligence. Perry had intelligence. When I first met Perry in the fall of 1966, as a 17-year-old from Detroit, Michigan, with a knock on, on my dorm room door at Vanderbilt Hall, I was immediately struck by his air of discipline and focus. I was surprised to find out he was majoring in engineering. Not your typical major for an athlete at a major university. He was valedictorian of his high school class. Not your typical achievement for a big time athlete. When we were united again 10 years after our time uh, at Vanderbilt, you know, at George Washington University in the late 1970s in Washington, D.C., I was really surprised that Perry had earned a law degree from Columbia University in New York. I had never envisioned Perry being a lawyer. He was a math guy, not a social engineer. But there at George Washington University in D.C., Perry had found his true calling in life. He wanted to be a teacher, empowering young people with leadership skills to lead successful, purposeful, and meaningful lives, to continue the struggle for equality, to uplift and protect the disadvantaged, and to create a community of families united in love and respect for humanity. In those days, his mantra was, to, to, to succeed, one must not just be an athlete. Athletics is just a means to an end. God bless you, Perry. God blessed you, Perry, and you welcomed him into your heart. Friendship. Perry was a true friend. He was always worried about me. He was always worried about me. I was an aggressive and outspoken northerner. Uh, his southern sensibilities had taught him that these characteristics 
did not play well in the turbulent post-bellum south of the 1960s. In a prescient kind of way, he described me as the Emmett Till of Vanderbilt. But by the 1980s, when we met again in uh, D.C., he had evolved from the Southern gentleman. He was now an urban, urbane gentleman. He had moved to Washington, D.C., and you know, had worked at the U.S. Justice Department, had worked with D.C.'s first black mayor, Walter Washington, and with Ron Brown at the Urban League. Ron Brown had not yet become a national Democratic uh, chairman uh, of the Democratic Party uh, and the Secretary of Commerce. He had cast off that cloud of uh, Nashville and Vanderbilt. He was his own man now. We were in our 30s. You know, we were in the prime of our lives. When I, I, I never forget when I first went into his apartment there on George Washington University after we had hooked up, and I go in there, and I see all these New Yorker magazines spread all around his apartment. I said, New Yorker magazine, are you kidding me, Ferry? You know what I mean? <laughs> but as I said, he had kind of evolved by, uh, by that time. But as a friend, he was especially happy that I had overcome from being cut from the Vanderbilt basketball team and uh, had gone on to a successful life. And, and, when we, and when we talked, and when I talked with him the days before his passing, and I know Karen probably was going to recall this because she was standing outside, she kind of left Perry and I alone, you know, let us do our thing. And she said, do your thing, do your thing. So uh, he and I laughed quite a bit because when he told me something, he told me, he said, you know, Godfrey, you know, you know that, um, that Capital One credit card commercial? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I know that Capital One, uh, Capital One credit card commercial. And he said, you know, well, every time I see that one that features that black professional owner saying, what's in your wallet? He says, I thought of you. <laughs> you know, many com commentators over the years have described Perry and I as opposites. Uh, but they are, they are wrong. Uh, we complemented each other. As he often stated, we were a pair. Two examples for change, two voices for change. I'd like to close with a little poem that um, I've thought up for Perry, and it's based on uh, an old slave, uh, southern slave elegy. And it goes something like this. Rest beyond the river. Rest beyond the river, my dear friend. Rest beyond the river among the lilies of the field. Rest beyond the river where the sun never sets. Rest beyond the river with the saints of racial equality and justice. Rest beyond the river in God's mercy and love. Rest beyond the river until we meet again beyond the river. Amen. Good morning. I was encouraged when you said good morning back to Godfrey that you may do the same for me. When, when I speak, I prepare remarks. I'm going to go off script for just a moment. One of the things that I see in Godfrey's face since I've met him over the last six to nine months and I see in pictures of Perry this morning are smiles. Smiles of who they are, a reflection of hope and opportunity. And I was struck just watching him walk up here that that's true today and true in the photos I've seen here. As Commissioner of the Southeastern Conference, it is an honor to represent 
our 14 universities here this morning to honor Perry Wallace, to Karen, Gabrielle, and to Perry's family, some of whom I've had the opportunity to meet. You have our deepest sympathies, but also our great appreciation for a life well lived. My office is in Birmingham, Alabama. I've used some quotes from Dr. King's letter from Birmingham Jail when I spoke of integration around Southeastern Conference athletics as we looked at 50 years back. I'll use a couple of those quotes from letter from Birmingham Jail because it's particularly poignant to think about where we are today through the lens of history. Dr. King wrote this early on in that letter, quote, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. End of quote. I've used that often when referring to 1967, that first year of varsity competition. And you know the story. Godfrey spoke of it, freshman in 1966. He was injured before. They played together in 1967. Back in those years, there was no one and done, no shoe contracts. The NBA draft was something very distant. We forget how different college basketball was 50 years ago. And so it was on December 2nd, 1967, that Perry became the one to be the first African-American wearing the varsity uniform of a Southeastern Conference University to represent that university in a basketball game. That game against SMU, two days later in a conference game against Auburn University. Thinking about Dr. King's quote, by playing in those basketball games, in that network of mutuality that is inescapable, Perry Wallace affected us all directly. Perry Wallace affects us today directly. I've read and visited enough over the last few months with pioneers to know it wasn't easy. I shared a breakfast in Atlanta with Godfrey, with men who played football at Kentucky in that era. And we had 10 minutes of talking and getting to know each other, and then I simply asked, what was it really like? It was hard. There's heartache, there's hurt, there's success, there's tragedy, there's achievement, there's disappointment. And yet, there's often reconciliation, dignity, and grace. The seeds of change planted by Perry, by Gottfried, by others have blossomed today into hundreds of opportunities, both athletically and academically, in the programs of our universities. Those who endured in early moments of change serve as reminders of our mutual responsibility to support opportunities for today's young people, to make certain we foster their education, their real education, next year's engineers and lawyers, and gen engineers who become lawyers, to support hiring of coaches and administrators with an eye towards diversity on our teams and bring together communities despite and because of our intense rivalries. Later in that same letter, Dr. King had a quote that is on the first page of the book Strong Inside. It says this, quote, one day the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be the James Merediths with the noble sense of purpose that enables them to face jeering and hostile mobs and with the agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of a pioneer. As a pioneer, Perry Wallace is on that list of heroes for the Southeastern Conference. He faced those crowds, he encountered the loneliness, loneliness yet he is a hero who has affected us all. Speaking of that dunk, if I understand the story correctly, it was that last basket he scored at Mississippi State that was a dunk. And as I've read his statements, in Perry's own words, quote, there it is, slam dunk, end of quote. On behalf of the Southeastern Conference to Perry, to his family, I simply say thank you for being a hero.
Now, a musical tribute from Professor Cornelia Hurd, the Valerie Parter Chair and Professor of Violin at the Blair School. Ms. Hurd's father was Alexander Hurd, Val Vanderbilt's chancellor when Perry enrolled at Vanderbilt. She is accompanied by Amy Dorfman, professor of piano, also at the Blair School. I don't know if you realize the jazz was playing as you came in, many of you, and the service features classical. Both were genres that Perry dearly loved. Now we will learn more about Perry, including his legacy at Vanderbilt from, in this order, Andrew Moranis, Vanessa Beasley, Sam Edwards, and Candace Lee.
Good morning. Good morning. If you think there's some pressure writing a biography of the most brilliant man you've ever met, just imagine eulogizing him. Um, I loved Perry Wallace like an older brother or a, a father figure or a favorite professor. Uh, the first time I ever met him, I was 19 years old. And by the time he passed away, he had a chance to meet my kids. And I remember when he came to our house, and my kids are four and seven, it was like Santa Claus or the grandfather had walked into the house and they just tugged on his leg and screamed his name over and over and ran around in circles. And he turned to me after about five minutes of this and asked me if I had any Advil. <laughs> um, and I've thought a lot about how Perry's life will be uh, interpreted now that he's no longer with us. And I would just caution us, uh, as much as we admire him and what he stood for, uh, not to speak for him. And I, and I say that for two reasons. First of all, he could say anything better than we could. <laughs> uh, Dean Fauché, I know you're proud that Perry was an engineer, but uh, he was a poet at heart. He had an amazing way with words. Uh, the second reason is that we would probably get it wrong. I think Perry was the best type of uh, intellectual uh, he was an independent thinker. He wasn't an ideologue. And I remember he told me, Andrew, you know, take some time to get away and think about what you really believe, not just what you're told you're supposed to believe, you know, by maybe your favorite uh, talk show host or, or cable news channel. So I would, while I would never speak for Perry, you know, one thing I'm confident in saying is that Perry would use today's celebration of his own life for the benefit of the rest of us. He always had a way of taking the spotlight and turning it back, expanding its glow and turning it back on everyone else. And so I, th I think that he would use an occasion like this to celebrate, yes, but also to encourage us and also to challenge all of us. We should celebrate the coming together of a remarkable man, a very special institution, and as difficult as Perry's experience was at times, and many times, I often heard him say is all you have to do is look around at the people in the institutions who are not working for change, who are in fact resisting change, to appreciate those people and institutions that are willing to move beyond the status quo. And we should celebrate leaders who have the courage to step beyond the status quo and accomplish change. Today we also celebrate a man over the course of his life had the courage and the strength and the simple decency to be a good man. And I say that with a capital G and a capital M. And this is even when many people around Perry were denying him his very humanity. He remained a good man. And it sounds like such a simple thing to be a good man. Who wouldn't want to be the person that makes the right decisions? Ethical choices, to act honestly, and to treat other people well. And yet all we have to do is look around us, or even inside us, or to look at Twitter, or watch the TV news. And it seems that these days, maybe the movie's boasting by saying there's a few good men. Are there even a few good men? There's very few. Of course, we're all imperfect, and God forgot, thank you, to test that even Perry didn't make all of his shots, right? <laughs> Especially after they took that dunk away from him. But do we just give lip service to character traits such as honesty, respectfulness, humility, and grace? Far too often it seems that's the case, especially for those born with privilege or elevated to positions of power. And so spotting this rare public figure, the good man, becomes a profound reminder of the best within all of us. And we celebrate Perry Wallace for allowing us to witness a good man in action. And that's where the encouragement comes in. Perry wouldn't write any of us off as irredeemable. He never expected anyone or everyone to be a superhero. He only asked that we made an honest effort at progress. And I imagine he would look at Vanderbilt today, one that just admitted its most diverse and most academically accomplished class in history, and encourage the university to stay on the course of justice. He would encourage us to seek more opportunities to bring Nashvilleians from all walks of life, life together as we've done today. And this scene didn't exist in the Nashville that Perry Wallace grew up in. And that's where he would challenge us to work harder, to ensure our actions align with what we say is important. 
Who among us wouldn't say that ethics and honesty and class are the values we admire at our very core? And yet Perry had a brilliant way of describing how we, de how we deceive ourselves, professing to reward people who work hard and play by the rules, and yet still diminish such people, maybe because of their race or their religion, their gender, their sexual orientation, or any other dividing line. Being African American in America, Perry said, meant understanding how, quote, insane and inane the world can be, in, the, in that a lot of the rules are not what they're said to be. He quoted Shakespeare, a line from Othello, where Iago says, I am not what I am. And Perry said that was his experience. Here he was, a high school valedictorian, Vanderbilt Engineering graduate, Columbia Law School graduate, Justice Department attorney, law school professor, great father and husband, and yet to some people none of that mattered. In their eyes, he was not who he was. But it was so obvious who Perry Wallace was. And Perry's sister Jessie told me she knew, learned all she needed to know about her little brother one day when she picked him up at kindergarten. And the teacher had left the classroom, and all the kids were running around like crazy, bouncing off the walls and screaming, and no teacher there, except for one little kindergartner. And it was her brother Perry who was sitting at his desk doing his work. And when the world in the decades to come went crazy all around him, Perry always kept his head. He always did the right thing. And recently I learned about a school a group of students in Cleveland, Ohio. And they've read Perry's biography, and they've related to it in a very special way. These are kids with Down syndrome, Asperger's, and other exceptionalities. And they said, the teacher said that when their students encounter difficulties at home or at school, she's heard them stop and ask themselves, what would Perry Wallace do in this situation? And it becomes the challenge that they issue to themselves when they're scared, or they're angry, or they're nervous, they're being mistreated, or misunderstood, or they need to make an important decision. And it's easier said than done, but it was the choice he made every single day of a remarkable life. Perry Wallace, the students say, would remain strong inside. Rest in peace, my friend. Good morning. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here today with the Wallace family and all of us today who are all fans of Perry Wallace. One week ago today in Washington, D.C., at the unveiling of those beautiful new paintings of Barack and Michelle Obama at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, the gallery director told the audience that a portrait was never really finished until a viewer, a member of the public, had a personal encounter with it. Upon hearing this idea last Monday, that an audience is required for a work of art to be complete, my thoughts immediately turned to our gathering today, and also to Andrew Marindis' book, Strong Inside, the book that taught me about Perry Wallace's life. Now, this book had already been read by thousands of people before my colleagues and I chose it as the Commons reading in 2016 which meant it would be the book that all 1,600 incoming first-year students would read before they arrived this summer, and we made that choice again in 2017. But still, it's interesting to think, isn't it, that perhaps Strong Inside was never really finished until we read it together here at Vanderbilt as an audience, admiring the challenging and beautiful art of Perry Wallace's time here on our campus. And it's also interesting to think that Mr. Wallace's story at Vanderbilt was never really finished until he returned with his teammate, Godfrey Dillard, to our campus in 2016 to give the Lawson Lecture to those incoming students, exactly 50 years after he himself had come to Vanderbilt to start his first year in college. I can still hear the students' voices, happy with anticipation for that night, and I can still see that long line of students after the lecture was over, waiting to meet Mr. Wallace, waiting patiently and purposefully to have their personal encounter with him, precisely because that his story had moved them so. What a homecoming that night was. 
And today as we meet together to appreciate and celebrate the way he lived his life, we have joy and peace because we know that Mr. Wallace has truly gone home. And those gathered here today also know that the full view of Mr. Wallace's story, which is to say his whole life, is so much greater than anything any one of us could read in one book. And most importantly, we know he did not live that life, not one minute of it, with the goal of being the subject of a book one day, even if we're, gl we're all glad he was. In fact, everyone I know who met Mr. Wallace when he visited Vanderbilt in 2016 commented on his humility, his quiet but steadfast sense of purpose, and the utter certainty you had within just a few minutes of being in his presence that this was a man of integrity, a man who did what was right, even when it was hard, even when no one was looking. In fact, through his honesty and with the grace of his forgiveness, we now know that some of his most challenging times at Vanderbilt did come when no one was looking, when no one noticed he was there, hurting and struggling, in need of support from his teammates or his classmates. But he did the right thing anyway, even when he was alone, time after time after time. He did not pioneer, endure, or overcome anything in his life because he wanted to be the subject of our stories. He did those things because he believed that his actions, his choices, would help other people. As we celebrate his life today, the things he did, both seen and un unseen, I want to proclaim this truth about Perry Wallace. His actions, his choices, his decisions, his words did help other people. At the time he made those decisions, he could have had no idea of the impact he would have on others, but he did the things he did anyway in faith that his choices were the right choices because they could help people. And think about being an 18 or 19 year old, 20 year old young man, making hard choices and having no immediate evidence that what you were doing mattered or would matter. In fact, he only heard much criticism, discouragement and disparagement, but he made those choices anyway. I wanna tell you about another choice he made that you may not be aware of. On that visit back to campus in 2016 to give the Lawson Lecture, Mr. Wallace asked us to do something. You haven't heard about it, it wasn't on the public schedule, and it wasn't in the video. But it was important to him to have one meeting before the cameras arrived to make that video. He wanted to meet with the current students in Vanderbilt's Next Steps program, our university's certificate program for students with intellectual disabilities. Students who might not have any other option to continue learning after high school if they weren't here. And so those students, having been told that Mr. Wallace wanted to meet them, gathered in the living room of my house where he greeted and encouraged them one by one. Godfrey and I are smiling because we can remember that meeting. He told them that he admired their courage for coming to Vanderbilt. Now just think about that for a minute. Perry Wallace told someone else that he admired their courage for coming to Vanderbilt. And in that moment, perhaps, a circle was complete. A personal encounter had occurred at his insistence, demonstrating once again the artistry of his own courage, his generosity, his dedication. In the celebration of Mr. Wallace's life today, I stand here to give thanks for the choices he made as a student, a brother, a professor, a lawyer, a husband, and a parent. May his portrait be displayed in the galleries of our campus, but more importantly, may his memory and his example be housed lovingly in our hearts. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, that was cool. <laughs> My name is Sam Edwards. I'm a senior here at Vanderbilt. I'm from Toledo, Ohio. Um, so first and foremost, I'd like to offer my sincerest condolence um, to the Wallace family for their loss. But I'd also like to thank them for 
giving me the opportunity to speak here, as well as thanking Andrew Marinus, Candice Lee, and everyone here um, for letting me say a few words um, on behalf of the student body. We are Perry Wallace's transcending bravery. We are Perry Wallace's fearless action. Our university and our city know no perfect past, but, it, but for his armstrong s steps, we witness a finer present and look towards a brighter future. I'm often in awe of the steps that I've been able to take at this fine university, just a poor son of immigrants who had to strive for survival before self accusation in a country that didn't exactly have its cards stacked in our favor. I leaped into a new world because of people like Perry Wallace, an academic wonderland with a multicolored population, a unique amalgamation of life experiences and goals, a network of bright minds and fun personalities who hold my best interests at heart. This is what Perry Wallace helped build and gifted me and my family. As an African-American student at Vanderbilt University, I'm forever indebted to the trials and triumphs of Perry Wallace. My opportunity and the opportunity of many like me are the realization of dreams like his. Yet, our university and our city know no promised land. Mis misunderstanding, prejudice, discrimination, they still rest in the folds of our red brick metropolis. But like Perry Wallace, we will not stay down. In times of hardship and loneliness, he kept stepping, and so will we. This is the spirit that cannot and will not be cast out. Perry Wallace rests as an infinite inspiration to Vanderbilt's next generation of athletes, activists, reformers, scholars, and leaders. The youth of this university will carry his mantle into a better world and will plant that flag proudly as an example of excellence. So for that, we are Perry Wallace's unshakable perseverance. We are Perry Wallace's everlasting legacy. Thank you. is big up here. Um, I think we're close enough I can be the first to say good afternoon. Um, um, under the leadership of Chancellor Nick Zeppos and Vice Chancellor and Athletics Director David Williams, our mission in Vanderbilt Athletics is to prepare students to become leaders and champions in life by placing the highest values on integrity, character, sportsmanship, and victory. Perry Wallace embodied this commitment over 50 years ago, as well as today. And as we celebrate him, may his example continue to encourage and transform each of us. It was just three months ago when I joined David and Andrew to visit Perry in Maryland. Even in his final days, he inspired us with his humility and appreciation for his journey. Um, in fact, he had, a, he had a wonderful sense of humor, and we actually visited a couple days after Godfrey, and the first thing he told us is that Godfrey is still crazy. He is just as crazy as he was back then. Um, I would echo Sam's comment, certainly as, uh, from a personal standpoint, as someone who enrolled at Vanderbilt um, as a freshman 30 years after Mr. Wallace, I know that I would not have had that opportunity if not for him. Uh, I, I just to go off script for a second, one of the things that he told us, we spent a few hours with him and it was just, uh, it's hard for me to put into words how meaningful it was. But e even at that time, he, he expressed one regret saying that he wished he had done more to empower women. And, and that's when I really understood his humility or certainly understood it in a greater way because I, he, he did empower women. He, he did it every single day. And, and I was just blown away by the fact that he had regrets after what was indeed a remarkable life. Just another example of who he is to us. Now, while the work of preserving this hero's legacy will never end, examples of the athletic department's efforts range from the retirement of Perry's jersey in 2004 
to his induction into the first class of the Athletics Hall of Fame in 2008, to the creation of the Perry Wallace Courage Award in 2014. This award is given annually to honor an individual or group whose work reflects Perry's trailblazing spirit and his heart for justice. And in 2017, we celebrated Perry and fellow civil rights pioneers during a commemorative event that we called Equality Weekend. Our men's and women's basketball players, some of whom uh, were kind enough to volunteer their time in preparation for this today, they're wearing patches on their uniforms this season in Perry's honor. In fact, that same image is reproduced on the lapel pins that you all received when you walked in today. And now, my real purpose for being up here, I'm very pleased to announce our newest initiative to cement Perry's legacy. So thanks to the generosity and the inaugural donations of David and Gail Williams and their children, David, Erica, Samantha, and Nicholas, the Perry Wallace Basketball Scholarship has been established and it will be used to support basketball student athletes here at Vanderbilt. Perry deserves, well yes, round of applause. That absolutely deserves a round of applause. Um, Perry deserves this recognition and so much more for a life well lived. And so to Karen and Gabby and the family, you have our support and our gratitude. It's now my pleasure to welcome and turn the program over to Chancellor Zeppos. We're recognizing an incredible hero today and I have the privilege of speaking last you know, I don't know, maybe Godfrey and Perry are saying, yeah, we basically done put the guy at the end of the bench in. <laughs> All the hard work's been done. Um, thank you, Candace, and thank you, David and Gail, and David and Nick and Samantha for your generosity in establishing this scholarship which will honor a student athlete who will carry that name and also carry the privilege and responsibilities that go with Perry's name. Um, Karen and Gabby, we are deeply honored that you chose Vanderbilt to hold this celebration of your husband and your father's life, our dear graduate Perry, at our university. It is a gift to the Nashville community and it is a gift to our university community to celebrate his memory and his lasting, enduring legacy, his incomplete but bold mission, his bold venture to create true equality on this campus, to have that ring beyond the walls, the Magnolia Curtain across Nashville, across the SEC, and across our country. I look at the dates behind me, 1948 to 2017, and in many ways they're by serendipity. I know Perry came a little bit later in life and had his great family to take care of him. And he was taken away all too early in 2017. Those dates are meaningful to me because I think of a country after World War II fighting what it thought was a scourge of genocide and racism and hatred and violence and extermination and coming back and failing to confront, frankly, the hatred, the genocide, the discrimination that our country had and leaving it to a generation of those who returned, who had served our country in segregated troops but fought under that flag and turning over to young Perry in 1948 to say there's work to be done. Yes, we fought on the beaches in Normandy. We took Berlin. But our work is far from done because of what we have to do to take Nashville, Birmingham, Selma, Detroit, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, Boston, many cities 
many cities that still lived formally, legally, practically under a system of Jim Crow and violence. And so it's 1948 to 2017, 2017, a celebration of his birthday, a moment of love, a moment of reflection, that little kindergartner who worked so hard and grew in to be a pioneer, a moment of reunion, a moment of accounting, a moment of reflection. I turn to my right, I see these wonderful pictures of Perry, Godfrey, I sneaked in one, but I also look to my right and I see that two of our chancellors are here as well. Chancellor Harvey Branscombe is interred in this chapel. He came around the time Perry was born, he faced a city, a university that was discriminating, that was blocking basic equality in education, in voting, in sitting at a lunch counter as an equal citizen. He had to come to grips in many ways, often incomplete, oftentimes making enemies in even his own alumni base for his halting and sometimes difficult decisions. I think of Chancellor Alexander Hurd, his children are here. You saw Connie, I saw Stephen and Chris. And the role he played, the role he played in saying, I think maybe the time has come to change things. And also I think at the way that Chancellor Hurd came to grips with the need for change, but realizing that more still needed to be done, as I think Stephen talked about so beautifully in the movie. And so, people often say to me, what do they do when you're not the Chancellor? And every time I come down here, I say, well, I guess they stick you in the wall. But I'm not on the wall yet. I'm not in the wall yet, so let me spend a little time um, to celebrate, to honor, to do justice to Perry, as we've said, but really to try to realize that in my role and the roles of my predecessors, we need to do justice, not to Perry, but to everybody. There's no justice if the only justice you get is when someone stands up and says, let's do justice for that person who has passed away. Of course there should justice should be done, but the justice, justice done is the justice every day. The promises that we make, the promises that our country has made, often incomplete, empty words, that Perry simply said, I just wanted what everyone else seemed to have who had a different color skin. Our university today, in 2018, is really what it is today, what it promises to be, the, the hope that it can be more diverse, more inclusive, that it can train leaders in a diverse, loving community where differences are sources of strength, where narratives of struggle and resistance are sources of inspiration to everybody. And that when people leave, they leave realizing that the story they brought is an important one, but it's one of many. And that as they go out into the world, they need to be prepared to lead, they need to be prepared to love, and they need to be prepared to empathize with others whose stories were very different. Perry chose to go to Vanderbilt, frankly, over, I think, the objections of just about everybody but Roy Skinner and Chancellor Hurt. He chose to believe in this university at a time when, frankly, many people would have heard, urged him to go elsewhere. He put his trust in the university. He believed he could get an outstanding education, and he believed 
that he, along with Chancellor Hurd, could really make a big difference. He believed that he could perhaps weather the storm to come. I think those of us who have listened to Perry, who have talked to Perry, who have listened to his family, to hear his story, can say with candor, the storm that he was to weather was a storm that no one probably could ever imagined until someone was in the middle of that storm. And frankly, the storm that he was in and he endured, he said quite frankly was, would I do it again? Heck no. I only would do that once. It was far worse than he could imagine. The hatred, the threats of violence, the questions of whether he and Godfrey would return alive from an away game, the support of some on campus, but frankly, even within the administration uh, of the athletic department and throughout the campus, finding resistance to the decision that he had made and Roy had made and Chancellor Hurd had fervently supported. And so Perry's story is a story of celebration. It's a story of courage, but it's a story that's mostly of courage to me. That we cannot possibly imagine what it was like for that young man to put himself in harm's way and play college basketball and excel as a student at Vanderbilt University in the 1960s. That belief that he had in the university was tested repeatedly. As Sam said, I think beautifully, is Perry laid a foundation. He walked a path that others could see, that others felt was one that they could at least follow to make the university fulfill the promises that it had made and the potential that it had. Because Perry made that decision, that impossible choice, that difficult choice, the choice that I, to this day, doubt that I could have made such a courageous choice. To be the first to, in that game against SMU, to be the first, the only, that is courage. That is being a pioneer. The path was laid for generations of students to follow. Perry's story has become a critical part of Vanderbilt's story. I have to acknowledge the role that so many played, including my good friend and colleague David Williams, to say that we have made his story. It has become. Because I think for many years, the story of what Chancellor Hurd did and what Perry did was effaced, was written out of the history, was still a point of, well, we really don't want to talk about that. It wasn't acknowledged as a signal event, the event it really is for Vanderbilt. Until his very last days, Perry had everything that you would admire in an individual. Courage, integrity, ethics, a sense of justice, and that inevitable sense of reasoning like a lawyer and looking at two sides of that ethical question and being surprised sometimes that if you asked it a different way, you might come at it differently and always teaching us, always teaching me because of the lessons he taught us, because of the stance he took, because of his love of Vanderbilt and his and Godfrey's reconciliation with the university, they have given us, they have given me, they have taught me that things can be better and that before you go on that side of the wall, Maybe you can make an impact on many. Perry's legacy 
will continue to light our way. It will continue to light my way. I know that I very much know. Our alumni are among the many members of the Vanderbilt family who feel the same way. Chancellor Hurd once said, you know, it's not simply what the kids are like when they come in. We brag all the time about their statistics. It's what do they do when they're here and what do they do as our alumni. That's the measure of the university. And so each year, the Vanderbilt University Alumni Association Board considers nominations for its Distinguished Alumni Award. It is the very highest honor that can be bestowed upon an alumnus or an alumna of Vanderbilt. Previous winners include pioneers in medicine, champions in business, a Nobel Prize winner, the first female commander of a naval carrier strike force, an advocate for global health and human rights, and I think in many ways Perry's partner in this era. James Lawson, a nationally recognized nonviolent theorist. What a pleasure it is to say that the Alumni Association Board voted to honor Perry Wallace's legacy as an icon, not simply of Vanderbilt and what he did on our campus, but as a leader in America, as a distinguished alum, as an icon in the American Civil Rights Movement, in his career as a highly accomplished legal scholar, educator, and practicing attorney. I am pleased to say that the 2017 Vanderbilt University Alumni Association Distinguished Alumni Award is being voted to Perry Wallace. Thank thankfully, we were able to share these thoughts and to let Perry know of this before he left us and I want to ask Karen now to come up and say a few words. It is afternoon at this point, everyone. Um, I have nothing written. I just have Perry to hold on to. That just makes me feel good. Uh, first, I wanted to welcome all of Perry's family first, his personal family, uh, for being here. But then I figured that because we're all under this roof this day at Vanderbilt, we're all a part of Perry's family. Everyone in here is a part of Perry's extended family. Uh, we've heard beautiful words, we've heard beautiful compliments about Perry. I just want to tell you two things. One is a story, a little love story, because we just finished with Valentine's Day. And the other is a little more serious, but neither one of them are sad, so they're good. So here's the story. Uh, I checked with Perry before I could tell it, because it's, it's, it's about us. So it's when I first knew that Perry was the one for me. So, so we meet in the 80s, and uh, you know, we see each other for a while, and I'm thinking, what a fascinating person. He's interesting, intelligent, and fun. And so it comes December, my birthday. And you know, girls, how that is. I had this dress and these cute shoes, and I'm thinking, birthday. OK, so except that it's the 80s, and a very important coach, John Thompson, is playing at Georgetown on that very night, December 11th. <laughs> So uh, Perry, always polite, always a gentleman, said, you know, would you mind if we watch a little bit of this? He had come over and I said, oh, oh sure, that'd be fine. It was a good game now, I understand. I loved it, it was a great game. But I'm looking, I'm thinking the dress, the cute shoes, you know. It was a nice game. And of course, there's this wonderful star, Patrick Ewing, so we got to watch that and see all the moments. And the game was fabulous. Then it's going into overtime. I'm like, you know, thinking about my shoes and the dress and, and then the comments after and, the, you know, so that turned into a pizza night. So that was all right. But I, I still think he's fascinating and wonderful. Okay, a couple of weeks later comes uh, New Year's. So I said, now we're going to do the dress and the cute shoes. I know that. Well, Perry says it's afternoon. He comes over to the, he says, you know, why don't we go to the movies first? 
and see some movies. I'm like, okay. And of course, Perry, I think you know from all the readings, uh, enjoyed the martial arts. So we go down to Chinatown in Washington and um, obviously he had been there before because we, it was old. It wasn't new like now and fixed up. It was old. And there was an elderly Chinese gentleman at the door who obviously knew Perry. Little bitty fella because came to his waist. So he bows, Perry bows. He bows, Perry bows. Any rate, so we go in to see the movie. And in those days, um, uh, the subtitles weren't as sophisticated as now. So you're like, you watch in a movie, you see the suns, and you see people fighting in arrows. But this, the script says, in the early morning when the sun was, I said, wait a minute. So you stop watching the subtitles, you just watch the movie. So here we go. We watched two hours of a great Chinese movie in Chinese. And he's enjoying it and loving it. And I'm, in, I'm happy. Then it ends. I said, okay. Then he uh, says, well, here's the good part. The good one comes now. <laughs> so, it's like, so here comes movie number two. That's the second movie. Two hours in Chinese. And that, by now, I'm like, okay, I, I get the characters. So then it's time to get up. And he, the, he said, this is the best one of them all. <laughs> That's the third movie we watched. That's six hours of Chinese movies in Chinese. Um, I'm watching the Shaolin Brothers. They're like the Warner Brothers in America. And by this time, we leave. I'm bowing. The gentleman's bowing. Perry's bowing. And I, I, I wasn't disappointed, but I was like, wow, they go to dress the cute shoes. I don't know. But Perry, ever Perry, always thoughtful, had already set up a situation where he said, no, let's, this time. He smoothly, that was his major adjective, smoothly moves through Washington, and I have time to flip change. And we had made reservations at a lovely place for us to bring in the new year. So all, and I said to myself, you know what? I'm in. I'm in. He, he's, he's got me. I'm in. So. That was the main thing I wanted to share. But the second is serious but not sad. It is this. You guys know you read stuff. You, I teach French, but in it I teach literature. So when I do that, I try to find a theme that students can hold on to, something that captures the, 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 the character. So I've been thinking about Perry's book and the chapters of his book. So to me, chapter one would be all you all, um, obviously Nashville, his family, his special family, and all the things that he went through. That chapter we all know very well. Chapter two would be more like, um, you know, Columbia, uh, New York, and then Washington, mayor's office, justice. We probably meet in chapter two. Chapter three would be the more international Perry. He's, well, he's at Baltimore, then he's at American, and, and we have a wonderful family. We have our Gabrielle. We, we, he's traveling. He's doing languages. And this is an aside, but I wanted to put that in. Perry spoke French. Uh, he wasn't riding on my coattails. Perry taught himself French like he did everything else. He had books in that room. He had apps. He had CDs, DVDs. He was working out speaking French on the treadmill, Perry spoke French. So I just wanted to slip that in because people think, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Perry ordered, Perry made reservations, Perry bought the tickets, Perry, so that's just for Perry, okay. Uh, that comes from his lovely family who encouraged languages all since he was a little boy, and he loved that. So Perry gets the creds for his own French. Um, but anyway, so here we are. Um, I lost my place now. I got to the French. Tell me where I was. <laughs> uh, chapter three. Okay, so we're doing that. Now, we all know, thanks to Andrew Marinus, who brought Perry alive on paper, and to Rich Gentile, who made him shine on film, we got to chapter three together, but mostly Gabby and I were in chapter four. It's a short chapter, but I'm not making it sad. It was short, and I'm not going to tell you what happened in it, but more how Perry lived it. And that's how it resonates for me. Perry lived every part of chapter four. And the two words I kept thinking of that brought him to mind were with dignity and with grace. His entire book, from what I can see, from one through four, was done with dignity all the way through. Everything 
and grace. Um, so think of the two fine gentlemen who did something special by bringing him to life. Every day of chapter four, he had to go deeper inside. Every day. And every day of chapter four was a triumph because you didn't know what was going to happen. So in that passage of this beautiful book of Perry Wallace that, that I loved, um, he did everything, as I said, with dignity and grace. Thank you for sharing his specialness.
as tears subside And I find it all so amusing Now just to think I did all that And may I say Not in a shy way What has he got, if not himself, then people he has not. He's got to say the things he truly feels, and not the words of one who Shows. I have to take a few blows But I did it my way Well, any good celebration ends with a party, with food and drink and talk talk. We have prepared for all who are able to just circle around the chapel and head into the reading room of the Divinity School for a reception and um, more to come as we celebrate a remarkable life, a life well lived.